and welcome to another edition of our treatment of the International Sunday School lesson. Today's lesson is entitled Full Assurance, and it's taken from the book of Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses 9 through 20, and it's for June the 23rd, 2024, summer quarter, lesson number three. Now, a little background information. First off, the book of Hebrews, we really don't know exactly who was the author, the human author of the book of Hebrews. Of course, we also know that God is the ultimate author and spoke through the writer of Hebrews, but we don't know who that natural person was that actually penned the words to the book of Hebrews. And also, too, I want to read the first part of the chapter of the verse that the verses that we're going to be teaching from today, because I think the first portion of that chapter is critical to understanding the or the rest of the, the rest of the lesson. Hebrews six, one through eight. Now, this is the initial portion of that chapter. It's not actually in the lesson, but I'm, like I said, I want to read this anyway. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of the instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, the and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those who, who, for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and to the ends of to be burned. So we see here where the writer is talking about some of the basics of the faith and also too of those who have turned their backs on the faith and gone back into heresy and apostasy. And he's talking about them in the first part of this chapter. And that is critical for the first words of the lesson. Hebrews 6, 9, and 10. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do. So here we see the writer of Hebrews is talking to people who have been dedicated to God, who have pushed forward, who have been faithful. And that's who uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking to. And he is reminding them that God is faithful to remember their good works. You know, just like Paul was saying to Timothy in 2 Timothy Four, seven, and eight. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So we need to remind ourselves and to keep in remembrance what Paul was saying there and to push forward and to strive to be a good 
worker for God. And we know that if we are a good worker for God, that we're going to be rewarded uh, tremendously at the end of the day. Okay, Hebrews 6, 11, and 12. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let me be real clear about something that I believe wholeheartedly and, and I believe the t Bible teaches is in multiple places. It's not how you start the race that matters. It's how you end the race. Uh, any boxer will tell you it doesn't matter if you start the beginning of that round uh, really strong and really smack them around really good at the first part of the round. If they count the 10 before the round is over and you're laying there, you've lost. So we need to make sure we're still standing, still doing at the end of the round. Now, James said in James 5, 10, and 11, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke of the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider these blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And even before the great baptism of the Holy Ghost and, and the advent of the church age, when Brother Job, all the stuff he went through, how that Job was pushing forward and doing the best he could and how faithful Job was. And we need to keep in mind Job. Hebrews 6, 13 and 15 through 15. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. And we see how that in the story of Abraham and Sarai, and how that they had been faithful, and how that they had had faith in God against all reasonable hope that they would have that heir. And they were so old. I, it is inconceivable to me how someone could be that old to be right at 100 years old and get pregnant and have a baby. Yet they kept having faith and kept pressing forward. Now, Romans 8, 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. But who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. See, it's not hope if it's already here. The integral part of hope is it's something that you can't see yet. And that's what we need. We need to be full of hope, waiting for the great deliverance from God. Hebrews 6, 16 and 17. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and all their disputes on oath is final for confirmation. For when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. See, it doesn't, you know... When you swear an oath, you swear an oath by something greater than yourself. The greatest thing that you can swear by. Hebrews 6 and 18. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. 
the one thing that it's impossible for God to do is to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. So if God gives you a promise, he's going to do it. Numbers 23 and 19. God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said he will said and he will not do it? Or has he spoken and he will not fulfill it? It is impossible for God to lie. You can always depend on the promises of God. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus was gone as a forerunner on your behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Mill. Melchizedek. And one of the important things about Melchizedek and the reason why the Bible re- multiple places mentions him is that his priesthood, there's no recorded start time of his priesthood and no recorded end time of his priesthood. From a typological standpoint, His priesthood is eternal, and that is a type of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms 110 and 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And see, that was a prophecy in pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a couple of concluding thoughts. First off, keep your hope and trust in the Lord God Almighty. If he promises it, he will deliver it. Well, friends, good Lord willing, I'll be back with you next weekend.